Hi, and welcome at this new episode of Women in Data Science, hosted by Pippel Amsterdam. So as you already know, Women in Data Science is this uh, original organization, originally founded at Stanford University, and we from Pippel are very happy to uh, give the floor to our expert females of different companies uh, to talk about their stories in data science. Um, today we're here with Zainab from TomTom. Uh, and she will tell a bit more about uh, data and AI uh, at TomTom and how we are transforming mobility. Um, just one quick reminder, during the premiere of this webinar, you can go to our website, website wits.amsterdam, and you can uh, uh, contact or ask questions live during the premiere. Zaina will be there to answer your questions, uh, so make sure to uh, make use of that. Um, without any further ado, uh, I think we can uh, start with uh, uh, the data at TomTom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Rose. Hello, everyone. I hope you and your family are safe and healthy. My name is Zainab. I'm a senior data scientist at TomTom. Tom. I joined TomTom Tom in 2018. And before that, I was doing my PhD in computer science and logic in France. I have a bachelor and master degree in mathematics. So my whole adult life, I studied mathematics. And uh, at TomTom, Tom, the core of my job is to extract insights from the data using machine learning, uh, data science, mathematical modeling to help my colleagues to make better decisions using data. And today in this webinar, I'm going to talk about data and AI at TomTom Tom and how we are, um, we are transforming uh, mobility and how we keep the world moving. So let's start. I am originally from Iran, born and raised in the capital city, Tehran where traffic jams is the part of the characteristic of this city and the main excuse to be late for almost all the appointments and or even miss them. While I was uh, back in uh, Tehran, I was uh, living um, the distance between my place and my work was only 40 kilometers. And given the size of the city uh, and the size of Iran, 40 kilometers is not that much. But every day I spend one hour, 40 minutes, one hour, 30 minutes in the traffic. And it was just one way. And coming back to home in the afternoon, in the rush hour, it was even worse. And it, sometimes it would take two hours for me to, to, um, to reach home. And while I was, the, back then, I was studying mathematics. And while I was the, in the, uh, in the, uh, stuck in the traffic jam, I was always thinking how these mathematical theories and how these uh, skills that I am developing while studying mathematics can help us to address this traffic problem. And not to mention that how much air pollution it, uh, it will create and how many accidents you can see on the road and people can, can, uh, can die because of the accident, because of the unsafe roads. And I, back then, I didn't have any idea about TomTom. Um, Tom. I didn't know where uh, where TomTom Tom is or what they're doing. But I am sure that it's not only me who is uh, annoyed by traffic jams, it's, uh, and it's not only Tehran. People all around the world are suffering from this, these issues. And uh, according to the 2019, 2019 traffic uh, report, people spend 87 minutes extra in traffic. Just take a moment and think about what you could have done with these 87 minutes. So I will give you my answer. I would have uh, watched four episodes of my favorite show, Friends, or you could have watched no, your, your favorite show. Or I could have read two stories of uh, the adventure of Sherlock Holmes. But you could have actually spent that this 87 minutes spending with your family, cooking, watching the movie, and you could have actually done it you know, in, in a better way. You could have spent that time better way. But unfortunately, we spent that time in traffic jam. So what's the solution? How we can address that? While I was a kid, as a kid, I was always thinking about flying cars. And I assumed when I grow up, there is going to be flying cars that, is, that are taking us from home to work and we can travel you know, in the city. But unfortunately, the technology didn't catch up and we are not there yet. So there is going to be, yes, in future, it's not impossible, but right now it's not a feasible solution. But what we can do, we can still make good changes. And that's what we are doing at TomTom. Tom. For who you don't know, TomTom Tom is a location specialist 
and we are working on the technology and solution to improve cities and improve mobility. And we are doing this by working on the solutions who help us to, uh, to work on connected vehicles, smart mobilities, and more interestingly, something that people are talking about, uh, always talking about these days, autonomous driving. These are the pillar of our vision, to have safer roads, smart cities, and also autonomous world. So how we can do this? What is the recipe here? I'm a data scientist, and you can imagine my, what, uh, what's going to be my, my recipe. So data science. We define data science as a set of steps and procedures that help us to extract non-trivial insights from data to create business value. And these steps and procedures are mainly advanced analytic. But let me show you what I mean by advanced analytic. You may have seen this chart before. So on the horizontal axis, you can see difficulty. And on the vertical axis, you can see business value. And there are four blocks of analytics. The first two blocks are called basic analytics, or categorized as basic analytics, which is the descriptive analytics that is answering the question, what happened? Diagnostic analytics that you are an answering the question, why that happened? And then we go to the predictive analytics that address the question, what will happen? And the more difficult one to achieve, prescriptive analysis, which says, what should we do? So we mainly work on, and our tools are predictive or prescriptive analytics, like or advanced analytics, or we call it AI. But it doesn't mean that we overlook the first two blocks. So every project, you can you you basically need to start with descriptive analytics to get a better idea about what is happening, and also diagnostic to see that why that happened. So let me elaborate a little bit on this business value and what I mean by business value. We are creating products and services. And we create these products so that our users like them, love them, make their life easier, and they use this, they, these products. The more they use these products, the more they will create data. And we, by using this data to create more uh, insights and analytics, we can improve the products that they are already using by adding the feature, by improving the features. And we go over this process to make better and better product. So when we are talking about recipe, it's going to be meaningless if we don't talk about what are the ingredients. And here, the obvious ingredients is data, which I'm going to talk about what the overview of, and I'm going to give an overview of what kind of data we have at TomTom. And this is going to be just the main sources of the data. There are other uh, data sources that I'm not going to mention here. So let's just start. So first, the uh, source of data is kind of given. We are a location specialist company. So location data and GPS data is the main sources of data that we got. Every day, we get 61, uh, 61 billion data points which is a more or less equivalent to 750 million kilometers. So I'm going to do I'll just give you a sense of how big is data. I'm going to do a funny calculation here. The circumferences of Earth is more or less 40,000 kilometer. And let's do a bit of calculation and divide this 70, uh, 750 million kilometer by uh, circumferences of Earth. And you will get 19,000. It means that every day, if you take just 19,000 times go around the, uh, the Earth, it is just uh, that much data that we got, that much location data that we got. So you can see how big, big, big th this data is. And so we are data scientists. We like visualization. So I'm going to just uh, show you um, visualization of the probe data. In Amsterdam, it's just one way. It's a very nice visualization. I really like it. And uh, actually, uh, some, um, some people who are writing the Medium um, articles, they are using this data to create these uh, nice visualizations. OK, let's go to the second source, mobile mapping uh, uh, vehicles 
or how we call it the TomTom -tom Momo vans. So these are the cars that are equipped with different, uh, uh, with, with different equipments like sensors, cameras, with uh, highly, uh, highly accurate positioning. And they are going around the world on the roads and gather all kinds of data and information from panoramic images, from the car sensor data, from the sign, uh, uh, um, from signpost information and lane information. And you can see that um, every kilometer it takes 125 panoramic images. And this is good news for data scientists who like uh, images. And so we have lots of lots of this data. So let's go to the third source of data, which is the satellite images. I guess this is going to be like our favorite one because um, so there, these, these days there are like lots of uh, techniques that you can apply on the, on the images and extract information from. But uh, before going forward, I just want to like put everything that we have so far in one picture. So you have GPS traces, you have the satellite images and the car sensor data and everything. And if you put this together, what can, can you imagine what you can have? Yes, I think you are guessing right. It's maps. That how, that's um, a, why, what we make at TomTom. -tom. Maps are the representation of the world that goes into your application, in your devices, in your map, uh, in your, uh, all the devices in your car. But we all know that becoming, be, being a data-rich company doesn't mean that you are tapping all the potentials of your data and getting like a maximum value of the data. So let me show you how, we, how do we use this data at TomTom. OK, I'm going to give you an overview of our favorite use cases, some, some general use cases, and some specific use cases. So I will give you some simple tips. Make, uh, look, look into the low-hanging fruits projects and create small successes and look into that what kind of where you can make a difference using data driven decision making and go to that go to them go to these projects and create a value this way your stakeholders can see by evidence what is going to be the benefits of making a data driven decision making and you can actually not train your models but also train your stakeholders and your managers on becoming more data driven on maybe trivial and small decisions so that when the big decisions comes, they have already trained and they can act uh, as a data driven decision maker. Okay, and I'm gonna give you like some of the uh, general use cases that we have at TomTom -Tom and it is, uh, they are data, the, these are uh, data driven decision making and help us, our, our colleague to make the data driven decision making. So the first one is, optimizing the estimated time travel. So it is important for the users, when they are planning a journey, they know when they are gonna arrive, what is the estimated travel time. And you don't want to just give them very short um, estimated uh, um, time travel because then they're gonna miss their, um, they're gonna miss their, uh, their appointment, they're gonna miss their, uh, where they, go, they, they need to be. And it is important to optimize that. Our, research, uh, our data scientists at TomTom, -Tom, they're using the uh, live and the real-time traffic the information and GPS traces, historical GPS traces, and all the information they have about the journeys to optimize this uh, uh, and they optimize this uh, estimated time travel. And this is, gonna, this is one of the uh, things that started as, as a uh, proof of concept and now it is becoming a, a, a product. The other two are kind of um, linked together. So it's the driving insights, uh, driving insights from, um, from our app usage and our application or services that we have to understand which component of, of the service, which component of our application is uh, more, uh, more used by the users or how they are interacting with, uh, with the application. So we can extract the behavior, be, um, extract, understand the behavior of the users and extract insights from user behavior to create more features, to create uh, more useful features for them. Okay, these are actually just generic use cases. It depends on, uh, this is something that we can see on different products and different teams. It's not a guess specific for, for one product. But these are the successful stories, like very small, you can start small and make a change. Okay, let's go to the next uh, use case. Traffic index is one of the interesting ones. 
It is actually a ranking of, uh, of the road congestion around the world about uh, all, all the cities that you can see. It's like um, um, several, uh, many, many cities that you can see in that reports. We are using uh, real time and historical traffic data to create this ranking that is the source of the insights that you can see about the traffic uh, information, road congestion. And please take your time to uh, scan the QR code in this slide to see and to check it for your city and see that where your city stands uh, in the ranking of the all cities of the traffic uh, index. So for highly for for HD maps to be accurate uh, to be accurate, the data needs to be labeled accurately and consistently. So it can be done using uh, like in a manual process, which is a very time consuming, or we can use artificial intelligence to use that. And the key here is to use AI. So I mentioned AI, so I'm just going to pause a little bit here and take the, take the detour and talk a little bit about the AI, and then we come back to HD maps. So AI is uh, defined as the techniques that enables computers and machines to perform the tasks that usually requires human intelligent, uh, intelligence to do that. AI is born, uh, in, and most people agree on this, that uh, AI is born in 1956, in the summer of 1956, uh, in Dartmouth uh, campus, where a group of leaders from automata theory and cybernetic gathered together to uh, create machines as intelligent as human being. Well, they were actually hoping for that, and they were optimistic, and they were predicting that uh, in, in future, in a very, uh, uh, very near future, there is going to be machines as, uh, as smart as human being. But they were underestimating the difficulty of achieving such, such a goal. But the real breakthrough in the AI and uh, in the AI area happened in 1980s, where computer scientists created algorithms that are capable of learning from data and to recognize the patterns. And for some decades, uh, the computer scientists created algorithms based on these techniques that we are actually using these days as well. And uh, the difficulty and the challenge back then was that we didn't have that much data. So we didn't create, uh, it wasn't like um, uh, these days that you can, uh, that every, every, every one of us is creating like millions of millions of data points every, by every action that we are taking through our devices, our mobile phones, our smart uh, devices. It wasn't like that back then. And also, even if we had that, we didn't have a technology to store such data. And uh, the computational resources were limited. But then, in the 20, uh, in, in 2000 onward, uh, a new type of complex um, algorithms came up that they are kind of inspired by how our brains work, but this analogy is not relevant right now uh, anymore. But these are capable of doing the tasks that um, some sometimes as good as human beings. And we call this uh, deep learning these days. And then at that time, the computational resources and technology, everything was, uh, was, was, uh, was growing and developing. And uh, so the, the, the field of machine learning was growing more and more to deep learning. And you can do actually very amazing things about um, with, with deep learning. But you may want to ask that why is that deep learning is um, such a successful uh, algorithm? That it, it created created such a, such a successful algorithms. Uh, well, actually, Andrew is uh, explaining this uh, intuitively using this uh, this chart. So, on the horizontal axis of this chart, you can see the amount of data, and on the vertical, you can see the accuracy. So, the red plot is the traditional classical machine learning, and you can see that. At some point, adding more data in for, for the classical machine learnings doesn't change uh, the accuracy that much. So you cannot do better if you, even if you add more and more data. On the other hand, for deep learning algorithms, if you add more data, then you can see that you can see a gap between the traditional classical machine learning and deep learning. So there are actually lessons in this uh, in this chart. So it means that if you have if you have a simple problem, so it's like a simple tips uh, to data scientists. If you have 
a simple uh, problem that can be solved with uh, usual and classical machine learning te techniques as simple as logistic regression, do not use neural network because it, it, is, it is what um, the classical machine learning is, would work better for your case. And if you, have, if you don't have enough data or you have limited uh, computational resources, do not use uh, neural networks because classical machine learning techniques is going to give you a better answer here because you don't have enough data. Deep learning is data hungry and you need to, uh, to give them like lots of lots of data. And there is one other tip that every data and every problem comes uh, with its own uh, prescription. So when you are choosing the model before developing an overcomplicated model, consider your case and consider your users and the stakeholders. Sometimes this is really important for, for people who are, use, uh, who, are, who are going to use this model to understand it. So explainability is now becomes uh, an issue if you have an overcomplicated like a black box model that no one understands what is happening in there. So keep in mind before developing the model, know your, uh, your uh, problem very well, know your data and uh, resources, and then develop um, the model based on your, your constraints. Okay, but anyway, we cannot deny that deep learning can do amazing stuff and something like magic. So are you ready to see some magic? Okay, let's start. So look at this artwork. I'm no expert, I don't have any background in art, but they look nice and professional to me. Who do you think paint these uh, artworks and create these ones? Maybe these people? We don't know. Let's ask Obama about this. Well, okay, we don't get uh, any answer, it's just lips moving. But the truth is, everything you see here is created by AI or type of neural networks, generative adversarial networks, or GANs for short. GANs are actually uh, how it works. It's uh, it created uh, in 2014, and it's gonna be like, it's, it's a revolutionary uh, technique, basically. So imagine that, so I'm gonna explain how it works. Imagine that you have two models that they are competing with each other all the time. So one model, they, they have two models. One is generate generator that is trying to generate um, uh, samples from your from your data. So it looks into the distribution of the data and tries to create uh, the samples that are very similar to your training or real looking data. And the other one is discriminator that is tries to discriminate between the fake and real images. And they are competing with each other all the time. It's a zero sum game. But the goal here is for the generator to fool the discriminator half a time, half a time actually. So that it means that the discriminator cannot distinguish between fake or real and it means that the generator is creating plausible samples. So you may imagine that, okay, these are um, actually a nice neural networks, they are fun. And, uh, but they can do uh, like a bit of scary things, you know? You can see the images, the faces that they are not real, artworks that they are not real, or you can put you know, the words in the mouth of a politician or a public figure and put it on the internet and it can make harm you know, to, to, those, uh, to those people. But it's not, it doesn't need to be that negative. You can actually do very nice and amazing things with these kind of networks. And that's what we were going to back to uh, to HD maps again and finish our detour and to see that how we are uh, making HD maps and how they are linked to what I talked about now. So creating HD maps involves extracting uh, semantic and uh, geometry uh, from, the, uh, from, the, from the road. And you may think, okay, why not? we use convolutional neural network or other neural networks that are good at the semantic segmentation. And by semantic segmentation, I mean labeling the pixels in the image that you can see. For instance, if we wanted to use the convolutional neural network, it's gonna be very good in the image-based uh, uh, semantic segmentations, but the problem that we have in the HD maps is not 
pair pixel labeling or pair pixel classification. Basically, you want to preserve the structure of what we can see on the road or what, what, uh, what uh, uh, an autonomous uh, car can see. For giving you an, um, a bit of a sense, look at these images. So on the left, you can see the input, which is a cow in a farm. And in the middle, you have seen and uh, you, you see the ground rules where you have actually this, uh, the labels. The cow is in red, the farm is in uh, green, and the sky is uh, blue. And if we apply CNN or convolutional neural networks on this image, you can see that some parts of the cow, like the legs, is missing, or you can see some a red spot in the sky, like a head of the cow is there. So you can see that the structure is not preserved here, something that is necessary and essential for semantic segmentation for, <coughs> for our use cases to create HD maps. That's why our researcher created a technique based on GANs that can preserve the structure better. And it is called LGAN, Embedded Loss uh, GANs. So I'm just going to briefly um, uh, explain um, wh how, what, what it is doing. So you can see they have a generator and you have a discriminator model, but instead of just um, only, uh, for the discriminator only uh, sees fake or real, we can actually train this based on all, um, both on predictions and the labels. So that discriminator is better trained to, this, uh, to detect fake or real images. And we, then we have a better uh, um, better labeling and more look, uh, real looking uh, images. So if we get a, an example of how it works on the lane detection, so for autonomous cars, it's very important to know uh, the lane detection is one of the important uh, uh, concepts. And as you can see in this image, on the left you have the label, and in the middle you have the regular CNN, and the thick line means that how uncertain it is. And we can see that on the car, there are like some red spots that is, uh, seems that it's like a messed up, so it cannot uh, do um, uh, very good there. And on the right, you can see LGAN that is very similar on the, to the label. And it means that how good it can detect the lanes based on this technique. So please feel free to scan the QR code. And this is a link to the paper that our researcher, um, um, the researcher uh, wrote. And uh, part of the code is also available. And this framework is generic enough for you to, um, to apply it to your use cases. So please feel free and uh, scan the QR code. By saying that, I will go for the closing of this uh, presentation. In 2005, TomTom Tom introduced uh, <coughs> this, uh, this device, which is um, actually maybe 2004, and it's been, it's been, it's been a revolutionary device in the mobility. And back then, it was like 15 years ago, I was in high school. I had no idea about TomTom. Tom. I had no clue about TomTom Tom or what they're doing. And since then, everything has, has changed. You know, the technology is moving so fast, everything is changing. But not only the technology is changing, but also the mindset of people and the culture of the tech is, is changing. So maybe 15 years ago, it wasn't that usual for a girl to be in the tech world, to be a data scientist in a male-dominated world. But here we are, and I hope in 15 years from now, we see like more and more, and we don't have um, any gender uh, biases in the, in the tech. And since that everything has changed, actually, you can see that when I joined TomTom, Tom, when I joined TomTom, Tom, uh, I joined the uh, Amigo team, and uh, this is a free application, free driving application. You can actually uh, scan the QR code and install it and uh, try it. But I start my work uh, in, in Amigo. So from 2005 to 2018, several, many, many things has changed. What I have discussed today is the work of uh, several heroes and uh, several data scientists who are working at TomTom. Tom, and I'm so happy that uh, I'm working with, those, uh, with these people. They are brilliant. And uh, I, I grow actually every day with them. I learned from them. And I'm so happy that I ended up at TomTom. Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Zainab.
Wow, I think that was a really great presentation about how TomTom Tom is using data and actually also about deep diving into different use cases. And uh, we also got a bit on the technical side, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, for me, it was really interesting. Um, I hope it was interesting for you as well. Uh, make sure that if you have any question during the questions during the premiere of this webinar, you can ask them to sign up. I can imagine that you have some, so be welcome to do that. Um, uh, uh, for now, I think uh, that was it. Uh, I really enjoyed this webinar. I hope you learned something today and uh, uh, check out our website to see any other webinars. Thank you for watching. Wow.